Hi, my name is Ed Chaney. We're here in Las Vegas at the Aquarium of Metabolic Risk Sun, and I'm here with Dr. Clay Jackson tonight. How are you doing today? Doing well. Good. Good. Clay is a, a, a boarded uh, family physician and also is boarded some other specialties. Maybe he'll tell us more about that in a second. This afternoon, he's going to be speaking on uh, neuropathy and diabetes, which is obviously an important subject. So, what do you want to talk about with that? Well, first of all, that uh, diabetic neuropathy is common. Uh, we have about 8% of Americans who know they have diabetes, mm -hmm. probably about 50% more don't have, know they have it, but they actually have it. So that's about 12% of Americans, one out of eight, have diabetes. And diabetic neuropathy is actually the number one complication of diabetes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, is, uh, it can result in pain, it can result in uh, falls from autonomic dysfunction. Uh, there can be a number of downstream complications. In fact, the number one cause of non-traumatic amputation of limbs in this country is diabetic neuropathy and vascular change. So how do I evaluate a patient for that? Well, it's actually fairly easy. We have a monofilament test that can be done in the office. Mm -hmm. And so you just ask the patient to take off shoes and socks, uh, close their eyes, and am I touching you? And that monofilament is going Is it a touch or is it pressure? It's pressure. Yeah, um, so I go like that and see if you bend it. See that's the idea. The monofilament is constructed in such a way that no matter how much pressure you put on it, the patient feels a standardized pressure. Okay. And so uh, they report whether they, they feel it or not. And then you can obviously send the patient to a vascular specialist, podiatrist, or neurologist for uh, secondary therapy. But the line sheet of diagnosis of diabetic neuropathy is actually made in the PCP office uh, for the. Um, uh, the NP, the BA, or the family dog in terms of see that. Okay, so I, I see my diabetic, I'm doing an evaluation, and I find out that they, it seems like that they don't feel. Do I need to refer them at that time? Just because they don't, they don't, since they feel it, don't sense the person. Yeah, so I think for that patient, certainly getting them a standing relationship with a podiatrist mm -hmm. is actually one of the, the most critical care components that you can make. And why is that? Well, they're going to need a um, foot monitoring. Mm -hmm. They're, they may develop calluses or other risk factors for developing diabetic ulcers. There may be specific orthotics that can be useful for those patients. Uh, their nail care is going to become important uh, as time goes on. They may not be able to feel their feet as well or see their feet as well uh, with diabetic retinopathy. And so getting them used to going to the doctors is actually a very good thing. So that's the prevent, down prevent down. the issues that go on with, with that. Absolutely. Now, what kind of type of neuropathy do you, do you think of in well, diabetics can also um, run into things as they age, such as cancer. You could have neoplastic induced neuropathies. There can be uh, dietary or vitamin deficiencies, right. such as vitamin D, vitamin B12, and those can coalesce. It looks like perhaps that vitamin D deficiency actually may be a final common pathway for sensitizing the periphery for actually feeling uh, pain. There's an interesting study, and we'll discuss this in our talk, that shows that a single dose of 600,000 international units, IM or vitamin D, actually decreased neuropathic symptoms at 10 weeks. Wow. And this was held true whether the patient was serum deficient in vitamin D or not. And so it's a fascinating study uh, that we're actually replicating at uh, Memphis Tennessee Plus Cancer Center to look at chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy to see if it works there as well. Now, let's go back to thinking about, you, you mentioned vitamin B12, you said vitamin D2. Uh, did, should I be getting a vitamin B12 level or a vitamin D uh, level on all my patients that have neuropathy, diabetics with neuropathy? Well, one of the things that you said that's very important there is diabetics with neuropathy doesn't mean diabetic neuropathy. Uh -huh. They may have neuropathy from a secondary source. And so we want to rule out other causes such as vitamin deficiency, such as vitamin B12. Certainly want to check vitamin D because it's common. Uh, in patients who have um, uh, chronic illnesses such as chronic pain, uh, diabetes, depression, and other uh, chronic illnesses. So we want to make sure that we have the right diagnosis first before we start throwing uh, pharmacological Sure, in. sure. Do you, do you uh, get a B12 level if it's low, blame it on the metformin? <laughs> Great question. I have to blame it on something, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I think it's important in patients who are B12 patients, obviously, to bring them up to speed. Right. Then we turn to what is symptomatic therapy. Cat out of the bag here, we don't have great, great specific drugs right. for diabetic neuropathy. Certainly, the is an indicated therapy that we can use. Uh, Pregabalin is an indicated right. therapy that we can use. Uh, there are others that work. One of the surprising things, if you actually look at randomized controlled trials, and not all these are head-to-head -head trials, but 
randomized control trials actually indicate that some of the older medications, such as the TCAs, and the older membrane modulators, such as carbamazepine and valproate, may actually be quite effective. Now, we need to balance the adverse events of those older agents vis-a-vis -vis their activity, but in terms of sheer efficacy, some of them can be quite effective, and for patients that may be watching costs or may have another reason to be on them, such as general anesthesia disorder, et cetera, they may be effective agents. What about autonomic? hear a lot about relative to hyperglycemia. Is that common? How do you diagnose it and what do you do about it? Well, in terms of autonomic neuropathy, it can happen. Uh, peripheral painful neuropathy and diabetics can be a marker for autonomic neuropathy. I think for the purposes of our conference, which is a, a cardiac metabolic risk factor conference, it's incredibly important because this autonomic neuropathy may portend risk uh, for patients in terms of, 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 of CV risk downstream. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why a neurologic referral might be helpful for patients to diagnose peripheral neuropathy on because they may have some autonomic neuropathy. And certainly, if they're falling, you, you want to certainly you know, clear the rugs out, clear the pets out, all that, the, the, the loose cords that can cause falls. But you may need a physical therapy referral to see how they respond. There are good uh, physical therapy programs such as based uh, visual feedback right. programs that can actually help with rehabilitation to help patients who have autonomic neuropathy not to fall. How about the hypoglycemia? Is, is autonomic neuropathy common, you know, because it, it make it difficult to know when you're hypoglycemic? It certainly can because patients may not have the classic response that we show that when the sugar gets low that the body will respond because that is as you Point out an automated response that may be attenuated in an autonomic neuron. So you have to measure. Well, that's great. It's not like going to be a fantastic uh, conference this afternoon. Thank you for being with us. Absolutely. And thank you so much. Yes, sir.